Turn in your Bibles with me to 2 Peter chapter 1. Let's get into this. 2 Peter chapter 1. And we've been on a series about fulfilling our God-given destiny. Seven steps for doing this. And uh, we, re we review this all the time, but we have these seven steps are purpose, plan, provision, promises, principles, power, and process, right? Is it starting to get down within you? Are you have you memorized or is it starting, are you really starting to realize what it means as far as living by the word? And uh, we've been teaching here for the past, past few weeks about the promises of God. And I want to pick it up there again tonight. Second Peter chapter 1. We've already read this verse a few times. Let's read it again. Verse 3. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness. God has already given you through his grace everything you need to walk in abundant life and God-likeness. That means you can't hold up your sin and say, well, there's nothing I can do about it, but God's given me grace to, to carry this sin or to walk in this sin. He can't see it anymore anyhow. That, that's ridiculous. God's already given you power to live above it. Power to overcome. And we're to be people that trample the powers of darkness not have it tap dancing on our head, right? He says, through the knowledge of him, that would be the word, right? Through the knowledge of the word, that has called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us, given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. Not just promises. Not just great promises. Not just precious great promises but exceeding great and precious promises. Peter, I believe by the leading of the Holy Spirit, intentionally built up the adjectives for these, for these promises. Exceeding great and precious. And the average Christian does, doesn't even realize that there are promises in the Bible they can live by, other than possibly salvation. And God said the Bible is a promised book. The word of God is full of exceeding great and precious promises. That by those promises, we can live above and not beneath. We can overcome and we can receive of his blessings, right? We can walk in his anointing and his power. In fact, Jesus said this. He said, the works that I do, shall you do also. That sounds good, doesn't it? And then he added to it, he says, and greater works than he shall you do because I go to the Father. He said, you're going to do greater works than I do. Now, that is actually a promise. Right? Did Jesus say it? Right? Would that not be equivalent to God saying it? Jesus promised it? So we can believe God to walk in the power of the kingdom of heaven. At levels equivalent to Jesus. Amen. And as a church we can exceed what he did. Now. The problem is. Is how do we walk in that power. How do we walk in the power that promise tells us where to walk in. By accessing. What God's provided for us. Through other promises. And he said this. This is China's verse now right. Luke chapter 10 verse 19. I give you power to trample upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the wicked one and nothing shall be any means hurt you. That verse itself is, is packed full of promise. That we have the power to trample. The dunamis has been given to us, right? What well, has been given to us is to trample on the, on the devil's dunamis. And that nothing can hurt us. Nothing. I love that. That's a promise of God. So if you've been hurt, if you're hurting, if you're concerned you're going to hurt, you can work that verse into your life as a promise and have the power of that promise released so that you walk in a place the devil can't touch you. Now, are we there yet? There may be some there, 
that there's a bunch going there. Amen. Jesus said this at the end of his ministry. He said, Satan cometh, but he has nothing in me. In other words, not a single thing the devil can do to me to move me in any fashion. I want to be like that. Where there's no buttons the devil can push, no levers he can pull, no attitudes he can, he can, he can twist. And all I have to do is just declare the power of God on my life and trample right over everything he does. So the Bible is full of promises. Promises for healing. Exceeding great and precious promises. I've been in pain. Pain free is better. Promises for healing from any sickness, right? No plague nor calamity shall come near your dwelling. That means you don't have, ever have to be sick again. And you don't have to fear a calamity. Well, there'd be a car accident, your roof caving in, the tornado carrying your house off. You don't have to fear that. If you've taken care to put that promise into activation in your life, right? So sickness free. I, hey, I've been sick. Well is better, right? I've had calamities. God's blessing is better. Thank the Lord for his promises. I remember uh, I basically ridden motorcycles all of my life for the most part. And uh, at least when I was old enough to ride something. And in 1979, March, I bought my first Harley Davidson. And I rode the tires off that thing. I rode it all over the nation, everywhere, rode it to work. I, I worked for IBM. I rode it to work every day with a suit and tie, a three-piece suit and tie on the Harley. Had the only Harley on the, on the whole site. Because back then, Harleys weren't, how can I say, mainstream like they are now. And, uh, you know, now anybody can have a Harley. Back then, it was because bikers had Harleys. I still never fit into that mold. But. And I rode that thing, and then when I had children, and uh, my youngest daughter was was uh, probably one. I had a situation where a car stopped in front of me. I didn't see it, and I had to stop real fast and slide a little bit to keep from hitting him. And nothing happened. wasn't a scratch. Not, bike wouldn't drop anything. But uh, I thought, this is dangerous. I would hate to leave my children fatherless. And I sold the motorcycle. Because I thought it was a responsible thing to do. Probably around 1989. End of 89 thereabouts. Not first the 90. And uh, then I found out in the word. That God said he gives us angels charge over you to bear you up in all your ways. Lest you dash your foot against a stone. And I had a promise of God. That I didn't have to be in an accident if I would believe him. And it took me another several years. Because by, by that time, I didn't have the money to buy one. It took me several more years to believe God for a motorcycle. And then one was given to me. And uh, what I'm getting at is I loved motorcycle riding. But because of not knowing the promise of God, that was taken away from my life. But when I found out about the promise of God, that was brought back. And for me... Motorcycle is better than no motorcycle. Just my take on it, right? And so the promises of God will supply everything you need for life. To live in life and godliness. And we discussed this last week. The promises of God are verses of scripture that declare God provided for you some area that you might have a need in your life. Healing, finances. Your marriage is covered in the word, right? For years, I declared my wife is a fruitful vine within my house. And my children are branches about my table. I'd speak that through the day, every day. What am I doing? I'm decreeing the promise of God. And for your children, your marriage, uh, your, your career, everything you put your hand to shall prosper. There's promises in the word. And as we apply those promises, by faith, Power in those verses is released to cause your natural circumstances to line up with heavenly conditions. Right? 
I mean, Jesus said it when they asked him, how do we pray? He said, pray like this. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed or holy be thy name. That's worship. Thy kingdom come. I mean, that sounds good. And usually we think of thy kingdom come. We're thinking of someday when I get to heaven and, you know, Jesus comes back and, you know, he recreates the earth. God's kingdoms come. Well, let's read the rest of it. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. He's talking in terms of God, bring your will from heaven to earth right now. Not someday a thousand years in the future. Amen. And what he's talking about is decreeing the promises of God into your life. What has God promised you? Now we have in our bookstore entire books of promises of God called promise books. And you can look up in almost any aspect of your life and find verses that deal with where God has said you have this blessing available. And then by faith, as we work that word into our thinking, as we act on it, as we speak it, power is released from heaven out of that verse to produce heavenly conditions. You know, uh, I grew up much of my life in the South. Lived in Kansas, lived in Alabama, lived in southern Tennessee. And there was a tree. Now, I'm not really big into horticulture and such, but there's a tree I just always loved. It's a mimosa tree. You guys know what mimosa trees are? You go down south, they're everywhere. And my mother has them in her yard in Kansas. But you don't hardly see them in Kentucky much. I think we're at the edge of where they, they do well. And so uh, I wanted a mimosa tree in my front yard. So last year I brought from Texas, from my uncle's place, a mimosa tree, back two or three of them, little bitty sprouts he had come up in his yard because he has his yard full of them. Coming, he, they're a weed almost because so many are coming up from his trees he's got. And I planted them and it started to come up. It got about that tall and it went one day and it was gone. Either a rabbit or a deer had bit it right off at the, almost at the ground. Just bit the thing right off. So this year I went to my brother's house in Tennessee, southern Tennessee, right on the Alabama line. He's got mimosas all over his little mini farm. Three acres, mimosas everywhere. And I said, I'm going to dig one of those up and take it home, and I'm going to have a, m a mimosa tree. So I brought one back. Problem is I put it in the trunk. It was over 90 degrees outside. By the time we got to Kentucky, it was withered and dead. Did I already tell you this story? I planted it anyway. I said, I'm going to declare life over it. I'm going to have me a mimosa tree. I dug a hole, took the dirt I brought, put it in the ground. Had a, had a, that tree was all withered. And I watched for several days. It get browner and browner and browner. And it was dead. And my faith wasn't there to resurrect a tree. He <laughs> didn't try it. But then after a few more days, I didn't realize that the soil I brought back was full of mimosa seeds. And now two more trees shot up. Now this is back, you know, uh, probably May time frame, I guess I brought it, put it in the ground. And then when I saw the sprouts come up, I took chicken wire and built a cage around it with a top where they couldn't eat my trees. Those trees are about this tall now. Spreading out, looking great. In fact, they're growing through my cage. I keep having to make my cage bigger. What I'm getting at is, is I wanted to bring, I don't want to make some Kentucky, Tennessee joke, like a piece of heaven from Tennessee to, you know, to this barren place, Kentucky, whatever. I, we're not going there. But I wanted that tree from one location to exist where I'm at. And what allowed me to have it was a seed. Seed, in fact, apparently there were two seeds in there because I got two trees came up probably six inches apart, six, eight inches apart. And I'm going to let them fight it out. Maybe they'll grow together and intertwine anyway. A seed let me bring life from one location 
to a place that life didn't exist. I mean, there's no mimosa trees on my street. Do you guys see many of them around? And you guys have a mimosa tree in your yard? I got two of them. Uh, yeah, Aaron doesn't even know. He don't, he's got to see what they look like. They have beautiful pink flowers. They have like a bazillion leaves on each, each branch. Little bitty compound leaves. Anyway, a seed let me bring my promise from one location to another location. And when it was sown in the right soil, with the right protection and the right actions, the life was brought forth. And that's what the promises of God do. Jesus said this. He said, my words are life and spirit, right? Spirit and life. My words are spirit and my words are life. Are y'all with me? What's he saying? My words are seeds out of another realm. This Bible is spirit. This Bible is the kingdom of God in print form. This Bible is Jesus in print form, right? And what he's saying is you have the right to bring the seed of the word of God, which are promises, sow them into the right soil, and watch it bring life from one realm into the place you're at. And we can bring supernatural power into manifestation, supernatural conditions into, into, into play in our life through the promises of God. In fact, I believe it's the only thing that allows us to access the power of God, at least reliably from heaven. It would be like, did you guys see that movie, The Martian, with Matt Damon? Uh, they had an expedition to Mars, and he was accidentally left behind. And so he built this shelter and started planting seeds, right? Was it potato eyes? Which are right. potatoes, which form of their seed. He's planting these to raise his own crop of potatoes to live on for however long it's going to take them to get there to save him. And it's all the steps he's doing trying to produce earth life conditions on a barren planet. And those seeds contain life from another world. Do you follow me? There are no potatoes on Mars. But in the movie, he brought seed potato to Mars, which lets him produce an earth harvest on a barren world. And that's what the promises of God do. They're con spiritual containers of God's power and God's life and God's provision, his resources that is given to us through the word that we as wise farmers can take and sow into our lives, sow into our conditions, and watch heaven overtake the world's limitations. Do you understand this? And so we are a sign of God to become wise farmers of the seed of the word of God. Go over to Mark chapter 4. I hadn't planned to go here, at least this soon, but I feel like I need to, to stay in the vein that we're in. Mark chapter 4, talking about Jesus in verse 2, and he taught them many things by parables and said unto them, in his doctrine. Now we're about to read part of the parable of the sower. And this is a key, how can I say, component of the doctrine of Jesus. And this is something he came, this is what he came to declare to earth. Now think about it. Jesus comes to earth, born of a woman, goes through all the process of growing up as a, as a man, as a human, doesn't, is not allowed to start his ministry till he's, till he's anointed and tested at the age of 30 years old. And he's got what's believed to be about three and a half years to teach. Now, I've been teaching full time for 25 years. Do you follow me? 
And I've covered a lot of subjects, but I've, 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 I've far from covered the entire Bible. A lot of we have to keep reteaching the same thing, right? I don't even, I don't even have a, any, anything close to all the revelation of the Word that's available. There's infinite revelation in this book. But in 25 years, I've taught a lot of different messages. And I've actually been teaching for 27 years this month. September 91, I started teaching. Uh, God told me to start that Bible study in my house. So for 25 years full time, I've been teaching the word. And I've got every time I come behind the pulpit, I've still got to hear God. God, what should I teach tonight? Do you follow me? And God will give me the series to teach. Teach on this series. Your people need this right now. Sunday morning, he interrupted, he interrupted our entire message for a separate sub-message. Remember that Sunday morning? Well, you should have been here. Oh, never mind. He interrupted the Sunday series we were in for another message that was kind of tied to it, but it was, it was separate. Why? Because the people need to hear that. What I'm getting at is when you're teaching the people, there's a specific message you've got to bring. It's not just something you pull off the wall. So Jesus is here for three and a half years. How many know everything he taught was with, with, with extreme purpose? I mean, was handpicked of the Holy Spirit. This is what the people need. And the key message he teaches is about seed time and harvest in his doctrine. He came and taught how the kingdom of God operates and how we can bring heaven's condition to our earthly limitations and walk as overcomers. And he continually said, the kingdom of heaven is like, if you do this, you'll get this. If you believe and speak to the mountain, it'll move out of your way, right? And so, verse 3. How long have I been going, Charles? Thank you. Verse 3. Hearken, behold, there went out a sower to sow. This is an important message to God. This is an important message to, to Jesus. It's, it's what he's coming to teach us in his time frame on earth. The point I want to make is a very, very small percentage of the church understands this. And fewer than that are applying it. Hearken, behold, there went out a sower to sow. Now, a sower is sowing intentionally, right? We could say a farmer to sow, right? But he calls him a sower. There are cattle farmers. There are pig farmers. There are chicken farmers, right? Some people raise chickens on the side. We appreciate the eggs. And some people are grain farmers. I'm from Kansas. That's grain, you know, Bread belt territory. Bread basket territory. They sow grain. And this person is a person that is a, that is a grain farmer. He's sowing seed, right? And it came to pass as he sowed, there fell by the way, some fell by the wayside, and the fowls of the air came and devoured it up. And some fell on stony ground where it had not much earth, and immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it became or withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no fruit. And other fell on good ground, and it yield fruit that sprang up and increased and increased and increased. Just see that part in. And brought forth some thirty, some sixty, and some a hundred. And he said unto them, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Now, we're going to read about the explanation of this parable in just a minute. But so you understand where we're going. Uh, hold this spot. Go over to Matthew chapter 13. No, Luke chapter 8. I'm sorry. Luke chapter 8. Now, Luke chapter 8, he, he shares the exact same parable. 
It's worded a little bit different, but it's the same parable. And he gives an explanation of the parable as well. And in verse 11, Jesus says this. Now, the parable is this. In other words, this is the key. This is the key to this parable. Do you follow me? He's saying, here's the key to this thing. The seed is the word of God. This entire parable, although it can apply to finances, it can apply to gifts of service, it can apply to anything, because seeing God's not mocked, whatever you sow, you'll reap, right? But the primary application of this parable is about sowing the seed of the word of God. In fact, it's about sowing the seed of the promises of God. I mean, it doesn't do you any good to sow a seed if it's not a promise. How about this one? Father, I sow the seed. I speak out a decree. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. What did that produce for you? Right? What did that produce? How about this one? Father, I sow the seed right now. That verse I remember when I was young, Jesus cried. That's not what he's talking about sowing just because it's in the Bible. He's talking about sowing what God has promised you can possess. The seed are the promises of God. So back to Mark chapter 4. I want you to see this. Because this is, this is, the, this is the pivotal truth, the pivotal point I need to make to turn us from just surviving Christianity to thriving in Christianity. How many want to thrive? Verse 10, and when he was alone, they that were about him with the twelve asked of him the parable. And he said unto them, those that had a heart to ask, those that had a heart to seek, those that had a heart to, to, to be discipled. He said unto them, unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. But unto them that are without, all these things are done in parables. What he's saying is, those who will seek after me, those who will let me lead and guide me, or guide them, I've given access to the kingdom of heaven. All of its power, all of its provision, all of its possibilities. But to those that are not part of the kingdom or going after the things of God, those that, are, that, are, that have no heart for the things of, 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 how can I say, the things of God again. He said, I'm speaking in parables and they can't understand it. You know, I keep having to remind myself how sinners sin. And people that hate God can't see truth. Because as I'm watching things on television with some of the hearings, some of the fake news, some of the things, and some of the declarations people are making that are outright stupid. Amen. Let's be like Venezuela and become a socialist country. Do you not know history of that? Stupid statements, and you get you, you want to get angry, like, how could somebody be so dumb? And you realize they're sinners. They sin, and they can't see. And the enemy can turn about their thinking whichever he, way he wants to do it. And that we need revival to open people's eyes to see the truths of the kingdom of heaven, right? The point, the point I'm making is, is the world have not been given access to understand the kingdom of heaven. But you have. And because the kingdom of heaven operates differently or opposite of this realm. In fact, it's going to seem foolish to people in this realm. They're going to think when you start really stepping out in faith in the kingdom, they're going to think you're crazy. You stay up and all night and pray. Why? Well, God visits me. Right. Amen. God's given me visions. Right. Remember Noah? Who calls me Noah anyway? I'm convinced if a person really launches out seeking after God, 
the world's going to think they're crazy. And too many Christians are trying to act like the world so they're not offending anybody, trying to seem mainstream, and they're not leading anybody into the power of God. Anyway, unto us is given the mysteries to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. Verse 12, that seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand, lest at any time they should be converted and their sin should be forgiven them. Now, this is an interesting statement because we would think that everybody would want to have their sins, sins forgiven, right, and be converted. But apparently in the kingdom of heaven, God's only looking for people that want him and not just a cheap salvation. And he's, people's minds are keeping blinded until they come to the place to really desire a relationship with the creator of heaven. You follow me on that? That's the only way I know to explain that verse. But Jesus said, it's given to you that have a heart to know that you want to come and ask, you want to come and seek, you want to come and follow, you'll lay down your lives. It's given to you know, to know the secrets of the kingdom. He says, and he said unto them, listen to what I'm about to say in verse 13. And he said unto them, know you not this parable? How then will you know, how will you know all parables? Now, let me rephrase that a bit with an alternate, how can I say, translation, interpretation, what I think is an alternate application. If you can't understand seed time and harvest and the power of the promises of God and how to access them, the rest of the kingdom's not going to produce anything for you. How many of you have electrical appliances, appliances in your house? Can opener, washing machine, television. Everything we have anymore works off electricity, right? And you have all these things in your house that if you plug them into the outlet, they work for you. But that electricity that you're plugging into comes from a whole different location. Do you follow me? And if somebody cuts off that electricity, all of those appliances you have, mine would be boat anchors. I mean, if you have no access to the electricity, what good is the television going to do you? What good is the washing machine going to do you without electricity? Without something coming from another realm to power that? Well, in the same fashion, let the promises of God represent that electricity with power from another realm. And if you don't have the promises of God, you have no way to bring power to manifest anything in your life of the kingdom. Because the promises are the single container God gave us to bring power from one realm to the other. Gosh, a few quantum physics lesson coming on. We can't go there. Photons are little packages of light, little packages of energy. Oh, Jesus. That I believe are, are, are similar to the promises of God. The promises are packages. They're packages of God's supernatural life and power and provision that we can sow into our lives and see God's kingdom manifest. But without the promises, you have no access to that realm. Does anybody here believe that you can get to heaven by being a good enough person? Just be a good enough person and God will let you into heaven. Does anybody believe there's any route to heaven other than Jesus Christ? Buddha can't save you. Muhammad can't save you, right? Jesus is the one God sent to deliver us from sin. There's no other route. In the same fashion, he's the word made flesh. There's no other access to the blessing of heaven except through that word, through the promises of that word that bring power from one place to the other. And so what Jesus is saying here about this, this parable 
It's the pivotal truth to manifest heaven on earth. If you don't know this parable about sowing and reaping, if you don't understand this principle, nothing else is going to work. It's not going to help you to know any of the other parables if you don't understand this one. Amen. In fact, you can speak to the mountain till the cows come home if you don't have a verse backing it up. Promises of God carry the power. Verse 14, the sower soweth the word. And these are they by the wayside where the word is sown. Uh, but when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. Now, let me talk about two applications of this parable. Two applications of the sowing the word. The normal way we interpret this is about salvation. The preacher is the professional sower. The evangelist, he comes and tells people about salvation. He sows the word of God, promises salvation. And some people hear it, and immediately the devil talks them out of it, and they go their way and produce nothing. Right? Let's, let's, exp in fact, let's read through the whole parable with that understanding, and then we'll come back and look at it again. So there are theirs that hear the word and it has no effect because Jesus is talking them out of it. I'm sorry, Satan's talking them out of it before they even take a step. Those stupid, those stupid preachers are just after your money anyway. All hypocrites, you know, whatever. Verse 16, and these are they likewise, which are sown upon stony ground, who when they have heard the word immediately receive it with gladness. In other words, they get born again right on the spot, right? Oh, yeah, I'm saved. I'm forgiven. Praise God. And have no root in themselves. And so endure but for a time. Afterward, when affliction or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. Now, Colossians chapter 2, I believe it's 2 or 3, tells us that, we're, that the roots represent our faith. In fact, Ephesians chapter 3 says we're rooted and grounded in love by faith. Roots represent, in the scripture, roots represent an extension from the seen realm to the unseen realm. In other words, you look at a tree out there, you only see half the tree. You see the half of the tree that's in the seen realm. But half the tree is underground, it's in the unseen realm. Representing the natural world and the unseen spirit world. And faith Faith is our extension from our seen condition into the unseen realm of the spirit that can bring the nutrients and provision and power out of the unseen realm into our situations in the seen realm. So a tree that produces apples gets us nutrients and moisture from the ground, brings it out of the unseen realm and produces apples or fruit in the seen realm. That's our assignment. Same thing. We're to bring forth the power of God into our lives and produce supernatural fruit before the world. Now, Roots representing faith, it says these people that are on shallow ground have no roots. Stony ground. Now, I believe the stony ground represents mental strongholds. Just, let's just say uh, blockheads, head full of rocks, stubborn people. People that think they know everything already. They think they know how the church should be run or how God is going to move or what God's going to do. They, they're convinced already they know more than the Bible. Amen. And they probably don't even spend time reading the Bible or spend time seeking after the promises of God. Do you follow me? So when persecution arises, a, you know, the sun rises up, persecution or affliction, it says, because they have no faith to root them, they get mad and run away. And how often have we seen that in our Christian walk? People come and they're excited. Oh, yay. Oh, I'm saved. Oh, but they don't like me. I quit. They didn't take the time to get in the word and start putting down roots. Remember, roots are your faith. How does faith come? By hearing and hearing the word of God. 
Now, for me, when I was first saved, I don't know how it was with anybody else. When I was first saved, God supernaturally gave me a heart for the word. I was already an extremely avid reader. And I laid down every book I was reading and read nothing but the, but the Bible for hours and hours a day. And what was going on? I believe that was God moving on me to put down roots. Read, 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 meditate, meditate. Roots are going down where I'm believing what I'm reading now. Amen. Now that was me. You may have been different. But the word gives you roots of faith. And if you don't have that, people get saved. They don't get in the word. They don't root to what the word says. In other words, they're just believing what their mama said or their grandma said. And they never spend time in the Bible, never seek after God. They have no roots in themselves. And so they are destined to be uprooted by the first storm that comes along. Amen. That's why if people get saved here, we tell them, please get in the Bible. Read your Bible every day. Verses. I think you already know it all. It says in verse 18. And these are they which are sown on, on thorny ground. Or among thorns such as hear the word. And the cares of this world. And the deceitfulness of riches. And the lust of other things entering and choke the word. And it becometh unfruitful. Now here's a group of people. Get this. They've been born again. They got in the word. They're growing up in the word. But then something happens. Distractions arise. The cares of this world, they get too busy. The deceitfulness riches, they start to access blessing. Maybe, maybe God brought them the blessing supernaturally using their faith. But now the blessings are running their life versus seeking after God. Lust of other things. Well, I'd rather be doing this or doing that. And they're, and they're pulled out of that place of, of walking with God and flowing in the kingdom. Amen. And I've watched many charismatics. In fact, we're all in danger of this. With a genuine heart for God, have the world crowd out their ability to seek him. Now, there are times, there are seasons, your, your days are going to be impacted. And you're not going to get all the time you want. Amen. But use what you do get. And God will keep you connected. He says. Verse 20. And these are they which are sown on the good ground. Such as hear the word and receive it. They receive it. And bring forth fruit. Some 60 or some 30 fold. Some 60 and some 100. So four types of soil regarding salvation. Right. They get saved. They stay saved. And I believe that's a proper application. But he didn't say in this. There's nowhere here it says. This is only about salvation. This is one of the few parables that is in all four. No, it's in three of the Gospels. Three of the Gospels. My bad. It's in three of the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke. None of these declare this is talking about salvation. All they say is the sower sows the word. Amen. The sower sows the seed and the seed is the word of God. So I believe Christianity, and I'm sure you do too as well by now, as well by now recognize that salvation and walking as a Christian on earth involves more than just going to heaven someday. That God wants us to manifest his power. His blessings. He wants us to, his, his children to demonstrate. His ability to bless us and manifest heaven on earth. Do you believe that by now? In fact, he says he's coming back for a glorious bride. A church is, that has become so close to him. The, the glory has come all over their lives. And so I believe this parable can be applied not just to salvation, but to every area of the promises of God. So there may be saved people that come to this church, watch 
via the internet. And I tell them, we as Christians are to be wise sowers of the word of God. We're to live supplied by the promises of God, supernaturally cared for and provided for by God. Do you follow me? <laughs> That's God's primary way of meeting the needs of us as end time believers. The promises of God. And immediately the birds of the air come and say, you don't need to do all that. You believe in God. That's enough. Well, that sounds like work. You mean you'd have to you'd have to read the Bible and meditate the word? God knows you don't like to read. The devil comes and convinces you, not you, but you understand people, convinces people it ain't all that. And he calls it name it and claim it, blab it, grab it, confess, possess. He ridicules living by the promises of God. <coughs> and what happens? They go their way and manifest nothing supernaturally. And may have difficulty keeping their salvation. Then there's the stony soil. This is the hard-headed one, right? And so, in this case, they hear about the promises of God. They can maybe, the, I mean, let's assume they're born again, and they, they understand, they hear somebody preach that, <coughs> excuse me, they can live off of the promises of God that God wants them healed, and he wants them uh, prosperous. He wants their marriage blessed, their children blessed, and he wants to have all these promises manifested in their lives. But they have shallow soil, stony soil. And they don't take time to meditate the scriptures to build the promises of God into their heart. Now again, the promises of God to be manifest in your life require faith. Jesus said, if you believe and doubt not, you can speak to the mountain. That applies to every promise of God. If you believe and doubt not, you can walk healed. If you believe and doubt not, you can be prosperous. If you believe and doubt not, God will bless everything you put your hand to. If you believe and doubt not, that's faith. And the stony soil thinks they already know everything, or they don't spend any time in the Word that the Word can penetrate. And so everything is heard from a surface standpoint. And they may, may even believe that faith works in their mind. All I got to do is say it and I can have it. Well, I believe I'll receive a million dollars. And, uh, but they never had any faith in that. You follow me? They just thought all I had to do was say it. Shallow soil. So what happens is when they don't receive the million dollars, or somebody makes fun of them for going to that church, they get offended. And they leave and manifest none of the promises of God. Then there's the thorny soil. Now the soil with the thorns, they're born again. They hear about the promises of God. So then we get a promise book. And they get the promise cards. We have the promise cards here in our church with all these different promise areas. And they start reading these cards every day or reading their promise book or reading the scriptures. And they'll meditate. They'll think about it. They'll work that word down into their hearts. They're, they're allowing themselves to become spiritually minded. And they're speaking forth with faith what God has decreed they have. And the promises start to produce blessing in their life. Amen. However, their time in the word didn't include enough time in fellowship with God. That he could uproot other seeds that didn't belong there. Let me explain this. Why did the thorns come up in the soil? Because thorn seeds were there. Do you follow me? I mean, the sower sowed the good seed, but Jesus also talked about he sowed good seed, but tares came up as well. I don't care how good a garden you plant, when you plant your good seed, Weed seeds are coming in as well. 
and you got to hoe those suckers down, right? Well, in this case, the thorns came up. Now, I've had thorns come up in the garden before, had thorns come up in our flower beds, right? Lots of weeds, but even some of them have thorns. In fact, I've got thistles trying to come up into my backyard now. And if you catch them when they're little, grounds moist, they'll just come right up like many weeds. But if they get established, you can cut them off, they'll come right back again. The thorn seeds are already in our hearts before we were ever born again. Thorns being wrong attitudes, wrong reactions, wrong desires, wrong motivations. You, you, you understand that? S roots of rejection, you know, we could go on and on. Just unforgiveness from something in the past. There are seeds in there. Our roots in there. That even though the soil's been turned, it's not dealt with the seed. You know, I'm from a farming background. And when you go to farm, when you go out there in, in the spring, first thing you do is you plow up the soil and you turn the soil over. What's it do? It kills all the weeds. Loosens the soil for your seed you're going to sow. But it flips all the soil over, uproots it. <coughs> for the most part, it kills the weeds. So you have a fresh starting field. What turning soil over does not do is kill seeds. You can turn that soil over 50 times and that seed will still be fine. So when you get born again, those thorn seeds are still down in there. Those weed seeds are still down in there. The tares are down in there. And you can start to work the promises of God and they'll start to produce for your life. But without a relationship with Jesus Christ, which is purpose, remember our purpose. The thorns are not being addressed. And later they're going to cause you problems. Now the way it's supposed to happen is, is we go to prayer while we're believing God for promises. And God says, you need to deal with that area of bitterness. You need to deal with that, that wrong motivation. You need to deal with that area of jealousy. Or You understand. You need to consider why do you react to those situations like you do? Why does it set you off or get you upset or get you depressed? And God will have you start working on not just sowing your crop, but purging the soil. I, uh, have any of you guys grown tobacco in the past? You have? Uh, I've been involved in it some. And when we did it, I think that's probably how most people do it. We would go out in the fall. And we would take a, we'd find an area we wanted to grow the tobacco. And uh, put our seed bed down. And we stretch these big tarps out and put tires on them. And then you take these canisters of poison that kill seeds. And you throw it under the tarp and seal. You put dirt on all around the tarp. And it sealed that poison in under that poison gas. And it would go down into the soil. It penetrated on the soil. And it would kill the seeds. So when you came in the spring and you, you turn that soil over, there were no seeds in it. And so you'd plant your tobacco seed in it, and all that would come up were just tobacco slips. Now later you'd water all that in really good and pull the slips up so you could replant them in the field, but you started with just a tobacco seed bed. Is that how you guys did it? And the point is, is that gas killed all the seeds, so when your harvest came up, it was not contaminated. Well, God wants to do the same process in us. That he's able to go in deep and point out areas we need to address in our life. Thorn seeds, weed seeds, tares. And kill it down deep before it can manifest and cause a problem. But in this case, in the thorny soil, they never dealt with those motivations. So what happened is, is as the good seed is starting to produce blessings in your life, these wrong reactions start to come forth as well. Wrong attitudes. Lust, lust, lust and desire for wrong things. Deceitfulness of riches, right? That you're distractible. Cares of this world. You care more about your situations than you do about God. And it says they choke out the word that it becomes unfruitful. 
What's that mean? You don't get your time in the word. You're not building in a faith and it cuts off your ability to receive. And you were producing fruit, but all of a sudden, because distraction, lust for other things or deceitfulness of riches came in, it shut it down. That's why it's so important we stay in that area of, of purpose where God can continually not just grow the seed of the word in us, but purge the soil as well. And of course, the Bible says the sea or the soil is the heart of man, right? It's down within us. So I'm running out of time here. The good soil. The good soil, obviously, are those that hear the word. They receive it, and they deal with wrong seeds. I believe we've been in a, se in a, in a season for some time of God dealing with wrong seeds. Every time you go to pray, God points out something you need to shift. He's trying to go down deep and get these things out of the way so as his harvest comes forth, it's uncontaminated. It's not being choked out. It's not going to destroy you. And so uh, the point I want to make is, is if we apply this parable not just to salvation, but to all the promises of God, if you really look at the church as a whole, a lot of people may say, hey, I'm good soil. I got saved. I've stayed saved. But have they manifest any other promises? And now it becomes a much rarer situation. And then you can also look at your own life and say, really, am I really applying this myself? Am I really? Because this is a spiritual principle that all other pairs work, work by. Have I really made this a top priority in my life to work the promises? To get them, to meditate them, to speak them, and to stand on them. And watch heaven come to earth in my life. Because we hear it, it sounds great, but then there, becomes the, there comes the application part. Am I really going to do it? And that am I really, I'm not trying to step on toes tonight. I'm not trying to make anybody mad or scare you. But if we are not working God's promises in our life, we are not in the fullness of good soil yet. And we may be, we may be think, what we think is good soil regarding salvation, but we're wayside soil regarding the promises of God. Or stony soil, or thorny soil. And God's wanting to get us to the place in the season we're in to get our soil perfect. And we start really applying ourselves to living in the kingdom of heaven. Amen? Well, that's all we have for tonight. I hope it's blessed you. I hope it's challenged you. I hope it's Hope has made you, des uh, uh, produced in you a desire to be a sower of the word of God and to access all that heaven has. What a shame to be given so much and never apply it. Amen. Father, we thank you for your word. We ask you to seal it in our hearts, our minds, our understanding, cause to be people of great faith, accessing every promise of your kingdom. I decree according to your promises in the church, there are none sick. There are none in lack. There are none discouraged or oppressed or, or in heaviness. And each one here lives a very, very long life. None die young. And each person walks in joy, peace, and covenant harmony. We thank you. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Hug some necks. Share the love of God. Be a blessing.